thank you uh, everyone for, uh, for tuning in today. Uh, this video recording is uh, part of the Institute for Public Relations uh, ongoing series on measurement, uh, the future of public relations measurement, and how the current landscape is evolving, uh, especially in the second and third quarters of 2020. Today, I'm joined by a very esteemed guest and a veteran of the public relations and strategic communications uh, ecosystem, uh, Mark Wiener. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. And uh, Mark is uh, currently the Chief Insights Officer at Cision. He's also a board director of the Institute for Public Relations and also the 2018 winner of the Jack Felton Medal for Lifetime Achievement. Congratulations again on that, Mark. It's, uh, it's a hallmark of uh, your work and uh, many have uh, benefited in the ecosystem from the insights that you've provided over the years. Thank you. Mark is also a member of the Arthur Page Society and an advisory board member of the Museum of Public Relations. Uh, finally, Mark is also a advisory board member of the University of Florida's School of Communication. It's uh, my pleasure, Mark, to have you as a guest uh, today. Uh, strange times we're living in with uh, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, certainly from a public health standpoint and also from an economic standpoint. Many, many are wondering about the impact of the current environment on um, the role of public relations and how the profession is going to evolve moving forward. So for all of our guests that are tuning in today from, uh, from within the IPR community, as well as outside the IPR community, the goal in this discussion is really to uh, give folks a perspective on what we're finding out about uh, uh, COVID-19 and its role on public relations so far, and, um, and how public relations practitioners can really think about uh, the, uh, the landscape moving forward. So with that, Mark, uh, we'll, uh, we'll jump into a few questions that, uh, that we have for you and, and go from there. Great. So Mark, why don't we start out by uh, just getting your perspective on the extent to which COVID-19 is, is driving discourse around the communications landscape. How, how big of a factor is this across different channels and and, and is there anything you can share with us about just the magnitude of conversation that it's driving and, and the trend? Sure, thank you. And thanks for inviting me to be your guest. The uh, COVID-19 pandemic is having an enormous impact on business in general and public relations specifically. At Cision, we've been tracking the virus and um, in seven countries, and we've been doing this for, uh, I think, 10 or 12 weeks. And so we've seen how this plays out, looking simultaneously at media trends, as well as the rates of infection, new infection, and mortality, to see how these, uh, these, the, these trends and the concurrence of these trends portend for, uh, for now and for the future. And what we're seeing is uh, that the, the media environment is very much focused on the pandemic. So while I understand that public relations is much more than media relations, uh, the, the, the area in which we're focused is, uh, is media relations. And what we're seeing is that of all the topics occupying news coverage uh, today, almost 90% of all news is focused on either COVID-19 or in the US, Donald Trump. And so uh, between those two subjects, there's a, there's a lot of overlap. So for the, the likelihood of any other content finding its way onto news pages is, is remote. So uh, even, even major events like the economy or the NFL draft or um, the, the uh, you know, the presidential elections that are coming in November, all of these topics are being crowded out by COVID-19. Now, uh, this week, uh, it was something like 89%, something like that, where it was devoted to President Trump and COVID-19, uh, which is actually down over the previous week when it was over 
90%. So, so for public relations people, the practice of public relations generally uh, is, is, uh, is difficult enough. It's now even more difficult. So uh, what we're advising based on what we see is that uh, organizations proceed very cautiously in promoting anything other than topics related to their organization's help towards um, healthcare workers, how they're protecting employees during the, the uh, pandemic, uh, what they're doing to, um, to take care of their stakeholders and any, uh, anything else beyond that, we're suggesting that people just wait for a better time. Now this, this trend changes uh, all around the world where we see that uh, in China, for example, the rate of infection has dropped dramatically, mortality dropped dramatically. And what we're seeing is that the media's focus in China is much more open to topics other than COVID-19. This, this may be in part due to the fact that China's um, uh, media is state controlled, but we're seeing the same thing in democratic nations like Germany, where all the indications are positive for more proactive, uh, more proactive public relations, media relations activity. Whereas in the U.S., we see that uh, as a nation, infection rates are down, more to, uh, and the fatalities are down slightly, but that um, uh, still relatively high compared to other countries. Right. So in this case, media are more receptive to other types of stories, but uh, it's, it's very limited. So we're suggesting that if, you, if somebody has a story that they want to tell proactively, they think about what they want to tell and to make sure that their message is uh, credible coming from their company, but also uh, appropriate for the time and sufficiently compelling to journalists and, uh, and to media consumers to uh, to in increase the likelihood that anybody will see or watch or hear that story. Sure, that's great perspective, Mark. And certainly in, in the work that we're doing at, at Radiant Partners, one observation that, that I have is that there's two factions uh, or two groups um, that uh, really represent the client sentiment right now. Um, the first group is a, is a group that is essentially using the wait and see approach to public relations and strategic communications. That is, they are essentially recommending to their executive leadership team that any public relations efforts around new product launches, acquisitions, partnerships, um, you know, campaigns geared towards improving corporate reputation, et cetera, um, essentially are paused. And to, to use the uh, some of the research that, uh, that you were citing earlier, uh, they are in fact uh, justifying this wait and see approach by, by making the argument that uh, if, if a brand were to pursue these, these efforts, um, the engagement would, would simply you know, not be there and, and, and therefore this is why it makes sense to wait and see. I'll contrast that with the other group that we're seeing which is a group that's, that, that essentially has the perspective of trying to navigate the current environment and regardless of whatever that environment is. And essentially using the argument that if you delay um, these sort of business related public relations and strategic communications efforts, uh, that will simply delay the corresponding business impact on the companies as well. So. Um, so these kind of uh, uh, companies that, that, that have this sort of orientation are uh, just trying to navigate the current environment uh, and they are not taking the wait and see approach. And I would say if I had to put a um, sort of a, a percentage around, around these two figures, we're seeing that the wait and see approach is, is, is kind of the predominant de facto approach that, that many corporations are taking. Does that resonate with what you're seeing, Mark, in, in your role at Cision, or is there a different trend that you're seeing as it pertains to, to the wait and see orientation or the let's just try to do business as usual orientations uh, well, across your clients? I don't think the two positions are mutually exclusive. 
so there are certain parts. So the, the trends that I was describing are national trends. But if you looked at um, infection rates and uh, mortality rates in uh, a hotspot like New York City or Detroit, uh, and compared that to other parts of the country where where uh, conditions are more favorable, that would suggest different you know different um, uh, approaches to media outreach. Similarly, different categories of uh, and industries are affected um, in, in ways that suggest different actions. So, uh, when communicating through general news outlets which is what I was reflecting earlier, that that, um, that their focus on COVID-19 is diminishing and so opens up opportunities for companies to step in with, uh, with the types of content ideas that might have not been appropriate even just a few weeks ago. That, that those trends do not apply strictly in B2B and trade media. So there are certain, for, for example, there are certain whole categories that are flourishing in this environment. And the trade media, business media for those companies and in those sectors is very receptive to news of all types. Doesn't have to be mm -hmm. uh, specific to COVID-19, but for general news, that's, that's, our, that's, uh, that's the guidance that we're giving clients. Sure, thanks for that insight, Mark. Another question that, that I think a lot of folks are worrying about uh, is is the role of public relations and how the current environment you know will either positively or negatively impact that that role what's your perspective on that mark is is public relations going to change forever as a result of this and and if so how 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 do you think that might manifest itself that's an interesting question because uh, and i think there's a number of answers so i think um again focusing well focusing more broadly on public relations. I think the role of uh, the corporate communicator as, as a counselor to the C-suite uh, will probably be enhanced. That th th these are very um, difficult times and companies have never had experience facing the, these um, conditions before. And I think the role of the communicator is, is um, elevated as a, uh, as a as a um, as a counselor, mm -hmm. uh, so I think that is something that will continue, because uh, CCOs will you know will and communications departments will will prove themselves. Uh, I think that uh, in other ways uh, we'll see challenges for public relations because uh, certain agencies, for example, may not have the resources to withstand the um, the economic downturn. So we're just seeing some of that, but I think we're going to see more of it and focusing uh, also on the media, the business of media, we're seeing uh, media outlets uh, looking for government support or declaring bankruptcy. So fewer media outlets would change certain aspects of public relations. Agencies going out of business would certainly change or perhaps forcing mergers and acquisitions or downsizing in ways that would not have happened had there not been a pandemic. I think those are changes. And just as we're seeing in our daily lives, um, a, a degree of a, a adoption and adaptation that wouldn't have occurred to us otherwise. So this, so um, for example, uh, um, grocery shopping through delivery services, that's something that I've never done before, but I do it now. and. I kind of like it. I think it's probably going to change the way I shop. There's other examples that are similar to that. It could also affect public relations in similar ways that either corporate departments or corporate uh, or PR agencies uh, are affected because um, companies have done well enough in the absence of public relations to, uh, to withstand it, um, a downsize. So we'll, we'll have to see. Traditionally, uh, public relations has been um, among the most vulnerable departments within an organization. I think in part, that's because public relations has, in those cases, allowed itself to be viewed as uh, 
as soft. In other words, not driven by data uh, or informed by data so that um, the value, the unique contribution that public relations brings to an organization could not be properly quantified. So in times of, uh, uh, in challenging times, public relations uh, couldn't properly defend itself, let's say, because it hadn't properly built up quantifiable equity in itself prior to this, to this, uh, you know, to this event. So um, I think for those organizations that are data driven, those public relations organizations that are data driven, they will find it easier to uh, to withstand the challenges of the of the day. Uh, another interesting fact from that study is we see, uh, you know, when the outbreak first appeared and was uh, capturing more and more attention, up until the point when school closings and lockdowns were announced, then we started to see a decline in media coverage focused on COVID-19. But during the most uh, explosive time, when, when an overwhelming an even more overwhelming uh, amount of media coverage is, was devoted to the pandemic, we saw that social sharing of traditional news spiked. And what that suggested to me was that while social media is a great place to share opinion and experiences, uh, when it came time to share reliable, trustworthy information, uh, people on social media chose to uh, to share more credible sources like uh, newspapers, uh, television news, and other sources that uh, would stand the test of 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 the uh, of the pandemic. So I think that's that was that's I think a positive development for traditional media that it reinforces traditional media's unique role within the. Uh, uh, within the country, but also uh, that's a statement for public relations too, since so much public relations depends on uh, a healthy and dynamic media business. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting perspective, Mark. And certainly we're hearing that the, even the companies that hadn't particularly focused on on, on having a robust public relations or communications function, they too are starting to recognize the importance of that. In fact, I have a colleague who was uh, giving me an interesting analogy uh, a few days back, which was about how public relations tends to have a particularly high uh, sort of importance in regulated industries. And, and oftentimes in unregulated industries or, or uh, industries where regulatory uh, sort of evolution is not as um, big of a factor, there tends not to be this kind of sensitivity around precise communications, effective communications, et cetera. And in fact, my own observation is that this is in fact what um, is sort of equalizing the perception of, of public relations um, in, in today's environment. COVID-19 is making everyone sensitive to communications because whether you exist in a regulated industry or an unregulated industry, employee-based communications, communications to the general public around workplace policies, around uh, programs that companies are, are doing to contribute to efforts to, uh, to manage and contain COVID-19, uh, let alone all the sort of day-to-day -day, uh, business as usual activities, the reality is that communications are the fundamental mechanism that, uh, th that companies are using to, to navigate this current environment. So many, uh, even those that, that did not have a sensitivity to public relations and strategic communications before, uh, do now. And um, that's certainly the big uh, change that we're seeing. Uh, yeah. I I, I reinforce that observation, and I, and I translate your comment to to one related to corporate reputation and the importance of having a good reputation. Uh, so reputation is important because it's companies with good organ uh, good reputations enjoy benefits over those without, and uh, those the reputations 
of those organizations, of all organizations, are based in part on the workplace environment, uh, their financial performance, their leadership, their quality of products and services, their corporate social responsibility, uh, and other attributes. Now, so th those are the attributes that, um, that are used to measure re reputation. And the companies that enjoy a, or have earned a good reputation enjoy many benefits over those without. So these are things like they attract the best talent and they retain the talent. Uh, they command higher prices in the marketplace. Uh, they uh, command lower cost of services and goods from vendors because people want to work with them. Uh, they, their, their, fine, their, stock mar their stock price uh, is more uh, stable in, in bad times and uh, tends to grow faster in good times. Uh, and the communities in which they operate and across all stakeholders, uh, they're, they're more, there's a greater likelihood that stakeholders will, will act supportively towards an organization with a good reputation than they will with, to one without. This becomes um, a type of reputation equity account. So companies with good, org uh, good reputations have been making deposits in this account for, for a long, long time. And then from time to time, they have to make withdrawals. And these are those times. So it could be that um, even companies with good reputations have to, you know, have to furlough employees uh, or they have to, um, you know, shut down plants uh, or, you know, stop production, this kind of thing. So there's a lot of stakeholders who are affected, but the companies with good reputations will rebound faster than those, uh, than those others. Uh, so I, um, so I, to the degree that public relations are, uh, people are the stewards of reputation, even though I know everybody is responsible, everybody within the organization is responsible in some way in, in um, manifesting a, a good reputation. Uh, public relations is often most closely associated with reputation. And, um, and the companies who get that uh, and take advantage of the unique properties that public relations offers tend to benefit because they have better reputations than those that don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's helpful. That's helpful insight, Mark. And, and, and I think very prescriptive for uh, the public relations practitioner trying to make the case to their uh, leadership team on, on how to think about PR uh, in this current environment. Uh, you know, be before Mark, we, we, we turn to the conclusion of this conversation, I'd like to, to kind of explore one additional area and that is the, um, the role that public relations research uh, has had in this ecosystem before and, and how the topics and, and focus areas of our research, whether it's within the Institute of Public Relations or, or just across the entire ecosystem, including academia, what agencies are researching, what universities are researching, what corporations are researching, it, it sort of begs the question whether this current environment will uh, calibrate the focus of, of such research initiatives. That is to say, will the focus of public relations research, um, the inquiry around new methods, the exploration of, of new ways to measure impact, of, of, of new ways to measure nuances around different channels, et cetera, will this evolve given, given the current environment? and and um, will we find ourselves maybe 24 months, 36 months from now at a place where the kinds of research papers that we're seeing um, will have a slightly uh, different orientation than they do today? What's your perspective on that, Mark? Well, um, I, think, <clears throat> I think every organization uh, and every PR person within that organization or every agency that serves that organization has a responsibility to deliver a positive return on its PR investment. So um, to that degree, to that point, it's very hard to improve a return on investment if there's no measurement and analysis and evaluation in place to begin with. So um, these, these um, elements of return on investment to which I think public relations contributes are a contribution to sales, 
So uh, in many cases, public relations is a marketing agent. Uh, in other cases, as I was saying about reputation, companies with good reputations, people tend to gravitate towards those brands because they, those brands represent the interests of the individual. So public relations has a contribution to make in generating revenue. Second is that uh, is efficiency. So uh, public relations efficiency comes in the form of doing more with less or for less. And in the current economic environment, I think a lot of public relations departments and agencies are gonna be pressed to do more with less and for less. So being able to document the degree to which one uncovers waste and eliminates that waste as a way to demonstrate efficiency uh, is another return on investment equation, but it requires measurement. And the third, which is, um, which is upon us, is avoiding catastrophic cost. So the, um, the notion of catastrophic cost is revealed usually in, uh, in market capitalization losses. So there are certain companies whose names you'd recognize in, in industries like airlines, aviation, financial services, uh, who have experienced uh, significant market cap drops as a result of reputation related issues. Uh, and, and so as we look at those three, the connection to sales is the sexy one. Everybody in PR wants to make that connection. And I'll mm -hmm. come back to that one. Efficiency is the most accessible because everybody makes choices every day that could be, you know, who, who, um, <coughs> who, um, you know, which automotive journalist gets the test drive and which one doesn't get the test drive, those kinds of things. You know, there's choices that we're making all the time to prioritize certain uh, journalists, certain media, certain activities, certain campaigns over others. And those are questions of efficiency. Mm -hmm. So it's accessible, but it also can, at, even at its best, it can only represent a percentage of what is probably already a relatively small budget. So there's, there's savings and it is RO, an ROI element, but it's not much money. And then the third, the um, avoidance of catastrophic cost can be in the tens of billions and it can happen suddenly and very, um, dramatically. So, um, that, that in market capitalization can be in the billions of dollars. So I, I see that, um, research is a requirement in, in those three cases to be able to quantify a return on investment, not which as a, and as a point of differentiation, I'm not talking about proving the value of PR, which is subjective, proving or quantifying the return on investment is something that withstands a CFO's uh, scrutiny. So um, on the first point, I said I'd come back to the, this connection between PR and sales. There are developments and, um, and we're using this technology now that um, repurposes marketing, tech, marketing technology uh, for earned media. So in the same technology, although a lot less obtrusively and less annoying uh, that, that um, you've, you know, listeners have had this experience where you, if you go to Amazon to shop for something and then the next morning you start to see these products from other companies, some of whom you've never even heard of popping up into your New York times feed or your personal email, at least that happens to me. So um, that technology is called attribution technology. And without identifying the, the individual by name, it recognizes the IP address. And that's why, uh, you know, the ads that you get are different than the ads I get, for example, because they're tracking what you and I do when we're online. So now for the first time, it's being applied to earn media. So we can see which news articles people click on, not ads, but articles and earn media. And then what they do as a result of having clicked on that article. Do they go to a website? Do they go to a review site? Do they go to your competitor's website? Uh, do they download information or on e-commerce sites? Do they um, complete a transaction? So imagine now that uh, somebody reads a story in the newspaper about uh, a Caribbean resort. And while the people are not flying now or uh, and as a result aren't planning vacations maybe in the near future, but they could go read about this resort, 
you know, with beautiful pictures and all the information, click on that story. And now that resort would be able to see that that article led somebody to uh, a booking site and that they booked a, a week at this resort, whether it was, um, you know, used th through a, a travel reseller or through the airlines or through the resort itself. So that make, being able to make that connection and showing the degree to which PR drives sales is important for PR, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, because it, because uh, by its nature, uh, public relations tends to have much smaller budgets than advertising and marketing. And these stories live on in, in Google and other places. So if you're doing your research about resorts and vacations, you might find an article a review from a year ago, but it looks great. And you book the, you know, you book that vacation for next month. So mm -hmm. that uh, the combination of these two things that public relations through media relations has an extraordinarily long life and that the budgets are so small to begin with being able to quantify click throughs from a media outlet to a, um, a website and an e-commerce e site uh, reinforces the value that public relations, the great return on investment that public relations brings because the, on average, the cost for a conversion using public relations as, as, um, as quantified through this technology is maybe one third that of Google ads or uh, Facebook ads. So, the, so it's a very efficient way to, uh, as we've always believed, you know, we've always believed that public relations works, but now we can show the degree to which it works in, in, in ways that would stand up in the boardroom and certainly uh, at th times when budgets are allocated and when PR performance is evaluated. Mm -hmm. I think the depth in that perspective, Mark, will, uh, will help many, many public relations practitioners that are trying to think through how to recalibrate their, their efforts on, on their research initiatives in particular. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it would tell somebody, for example, if something's working and, and you can quantify the degree to which it's working, either through attribution analysis or traditional media content analysis mm -hmm. or through surveys, uh, you, you have the feedback you need to reinforce that, what, that decision that you made that generated those positive results. Or if for some reason a, a decision uh, generates a poor return, then you do something different or reallocate those resources to something that's more likely to deliver a positive return. Right, exactly, exactly. So Mark, I think we've, uh, we've officially run out of, of time. The, the good news is that we have um, discussed some, some, some really helpful things, I think, for the, for the public relations ecosystem. For example, we, we discussed the, the manner in which COVID-19 is dominating the communications landscape and the difficulty that many organizations have in, in sort of piercing and permeating, um, you know, the discourse uh, and, and, and conducting uh, business as usual public relations efforts. We've also discussed the, um, the focus that many organizations will have on, um, you know, on, on, on really elevating the role of public relations within their organizations to effectively navigate the current environment, either as it pertains to internal or external communications. And, and of course, uh, we've also uh, discussed the, uh, the manner in which new research methods will help public relations practitioners uh, precisely articulate the impact of their efforts uh, even in these times. And I think these three themes um, are, of course, themes that, you know, we, we talk a lot about uh, within our uh, Institute of Public Relations uh, meetings and, uh, and, and events. And of course, these are also the themes that uh, most of our questions came from uh, uh, in the course of this conversation. So I think, um, you know, we, we look forward to uh, uh, to sharing this uh, this conversation with, uh, with our community of PR practitioners. And this is an ongoing series. So for those that have um, an input on, on future uh, questions, topics, uh, or even guests, uh, we welcome them to, uh, to share their ideas with us. This will be, of course, posted 
on, uh, on YouTube, as well as on the website uh, of the Institute for Public Relations. So thank you very much, Mark. Uh, any final thoughts before we uh, press end call here? Yes, thank you. Uh, I want to reinforce uh, all of the free assets available on the Institute website, www.instituteforpr.org, in which there is a page, a site, sorry, dedicated to COVID-19 resources, as well as lots of free downloads of papers, opinion pieces uh, from some of the um, the best communications researchers anywhere in the world, collected in one place, all available for free. So I encourage everybody to go to the site and download and learn. Excellent. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you again, Mark. We really appreciate your time and your insights. And uh, that's it for today, everyone. Uh, thank you, and we'll, we'll be back again soon. Thanks. Bye.